scripture lesson for today is from Esther chapter 9, verses 9 to 14. And Hattuk went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hattuk and gave him a message from Mordecai, saying, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. And I have not been called to come into these king these thirty days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to return answer to Esther. Think not that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. The Otter Cliffs and Canyon National Park are hardly the highest or most challenging uh, place to do rock climbing. But they do bring somewhat of a challenge. I've had the opportunity to go climbing there three times, uh, and usually when I've mentioned that to people, this has been in the last so years, people will say, how did you do that at your age? <laughs> <laughs> but to be honest, while it does take some physical strength, it's not as scary as you might think. Because you wear a helmet, you've got a harness, you've got the ropes, you have a belay system, and an instructor at the top who keeps looking over the side and saying, well, there's a place for your hand to go here or there. And you actually can get up there. I learned that when you are rock climbing this way, if you fall, you will only fall the distance of your legs. So the biggest danger is smashing your nose up against the rock. <laughs> I have never broken my nose, so you can know that that didn't happen. It was not exactly that way the first time I ever went rock climbing. That was actually at Camp Sumatanga in the North Alabama Conference a number of years ago. And again, we were, went to this place, kind of out of the middle of nowhere, and we got the harnesses, and we had the helmets, and the ropes, and everything were all tied in. And uh, the instructor said, okay, now walk to the edge. Because we started by rappelling and then we climbed back up. So we walked to the edge. You see, now I want you to turn around and keep your legs pretty straight and then sit down. And my first reaction was, I'm sorry, sir, I'm not going to do that. There's nothing to sit on, it's just air. But eventually, yeah, you do it. And it just is <coughs> hard to be that courageous and bold when you've got all the safety features that are going on around you. However, I think about Esther, a woman from our scripture lesson this morning. She was courageous and bold. Those of you who aren't familiar with the story of Esther, she had been married to the king after kind of a long tryout process. He didn't like his first wife because she dared to go before the king without being summoned. So she got banished. And the first wife was lucky because she could have been put to death. And now Esther is married to the king and the Jews were facing great persecution. 
and her uncle sends a message to her. Her uncle is Mordecai and says, you need to go and talk to the king and tell him that he needed to deliver the Jews from this. Now for Mordecai, Esther looked like she was in a place of privilege. And in some ways she was. I mean, she lived in a royal palace. However, she really was a woman without power. She was just chosen by the king. He could get rid of her as easy as he got rid of somebody else. She had, as a, as a woman, she had no real authority. And so she was really vulnerable. In fact, she hid, she hid her Jewishness because she went by the name of Esther rather than her Hebrew name of Hadassah. And Mordecai reminds her in what is one of, my, one of my favorite verses. Who knows but that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Who knows, maybe the only reason that you were ever married to the king was because we need you for your people at this time. And don't think that she wasn't fearful. Because she was filled with fear, but she still was courageous and bold. There is courage for you. Someone who, in the face of danger, still speaks up and speaks truth to power. Real courage isn't when you have all the safety nets. Real courage is that even in the midst of fear, you step out on faith. You know, it's kind of part of the, the entire biblical story where we see that. Because Esther wasn't the only one who stepped out on faith. We have the story of, in 1 Samuel, of David and Goliath. Now, I don't know whether uh, Goliath really was 9, 10, 12 feet tall. I don't know how big he was. But basically, here was David. And the story is, it's a great story to read. You know, David put on all the armor kind of to protect himself. And he couldn't, he couldn't maneuver. I kind of picture him like a turtle on his back. You know, he kind of fell over and had to get the armor off of him because he couldn't face the turtle. So he went up against Goliath without all that safety stuff. There was a man named Ananias. And in the book of Acts, God speaks to Ananias and says, I want you to go and place your hands on Saul, who we later know by his Greek name, Paul, so that you might heal his blindness, because Paul had been blinded on the road to Damascus. But remember Paul's history. He had just come from Jerusalem, where he had held the folks and participated in the stoning of Stephen. He had killed Christians. I don't think Ananias would say, oh, that sounds like a fun day at the, at the park. No. He too was fearful, but he went because God sent him. And then there were these three women who went to a tomb early on a Sunday morning after seeing Jesus crucified. And this is a tomb guarded by Roman soldiers who cared little about the lives of the Jewish people. But they went anyway because they knew they had a task to do, and that was to prepare the body of their Lord who had been crucified just on that front. The scriptures are filled with people who, in the midst of fear, still stood for what they knew God was calling them to do. And we are called no less than that as Christians today. <coughs> Sometimes it's easier to just kind of, you know, put a finger up into the wind and see which way is the wind blowing so we can know what would be the more popular thing to say. Whether or not it's faithful, at least it's not going to get us in trouble. Or we want to have the safety, 
safety in numbers, we want to have the safety of power, whether that be economic or political power. We look for these things, and it's easy to be bold and courageous when we have all of that. But it's not so easy when we are facing uncertainty. Now, if you read the book of Esther from beginning to end, you'll find that the name of God does not appear anywhere in the book of Esther. But I like what John Wesley, founder of Methodism, had to say in his notes on the uh, Old Testament. And that was this, that the name of God is not found in this book, but the finger of God is directing so many minute events for the deliverance of his people. Think about that. The fingers of God being involved in our lives day by day, leading us, guiding us, supporting us, encouraging us, that the Spirit empowers us to speak truth in the midst of challenges, to be courageous and bold, even if we are fearful. You know, the longer I live, the more uncertainty I have. You know, I thought that when, at least according to my one grandson, I got to be older than dirt. <laughs> I would be pretty sure and certain about life. And you know, when I was younger, I thought I knew quite a bit. Not everything, but almost. And I thought by the time I got to, you know, be around another 20, 30, or more years, that I would really be certain about everything in life. I've got a little sign in my office. You can see it if you go in there. And it says, people who think they know everything are particularly annoying to those of us who do. <laughs> <laughs> little tongue in cheek there, OK? <laughs> but you know, I'm not certain anymore. Instead, you know, I wonder. I wonder about a lot of things. I wonder. Why? We are now so concerned about safety for our children in schools. We have to have things like active shooter drills in school. And yet we have politicians who won't deal with gun safety. I wonder, I wonder why A border that's created by either negotiation or more often by the result of war or violence is supposedly more sacred than the borders God created for us. And I have a picture that I call my map of the world. And it's taken from the moon of the earth. And you know there's a very interesting thing about that picture. The countries aren't all marked out in different colors. And there's no lines in between them and names printed on them. How does God see the world? God sees the world as one world, as one human family. Why is it that we have so much struggle over borders? I wonder why our American family values, which we celebrate in bringing the family together, more sacred in North America than they are for Central American or South American families who are being separated and torn apart. I wonder why 65 years after Brown versus Board of Education, there is still such an equity in our educational systems between children of color and children of the majority. And we continue to have even here in New Jersey, we have one of the most highly segregated education systems in the nation. I wonder, I wonder why this ability in public discourse 
is the exception and not the rule. And why it is that we can't sit down with one another. Even when we disagree and talk without being disagreeable and without having to demonize those who disagree with us. I wonder how we as a denomination continue to exclude persons because of who God created them to be. And then I wonder who will be next? Maybe you and I have been called for such a time as this to speak truth when others may not. To take an unpopular stand and not worry about it, knowing that God will support us and will be there for us. To say what is right according to what our faith tells us and not worry as to whether others will agree with us or not or whether we'll have popular opinion on our side. Like Esther, we're challenged in this century because if we don't speak up, I wonder who will. I wonder whether there are others who once they hear a voice speaking truth will actually say, yeah, I agree with that. I think we do find that in the church. As I was preparing the sermon, I started looking for the, um, the standout heroes and heroines who would be like Esther. Who were the modern day Esther? And I looked, I saw Oscar Romero. Perhaps he was one in El Salvador or Nelson Mandela in apartheid written in South Africa. But then I really started thinking about, okay, who are the modern day Esthers? And I think about two women, for instance, when I served in the Branchville Church, who dared to speak truth to a social worker who was in a position of power at that point. As a church, we had befriended and began to help out a woman who had full-blown maids who lived just two doors away from the church. And she had a daughter. And the daughter was in foster care because she was unable to take care of her. And the social worker said to her, well, we're not going to allow you to visit this daughter because you're going to die anyway. And it's just easier for you not to have any more contact. And they dared to speak up and say, that is wrong. They need to have closure like anybody else. They need to have whatever relationship they could build at this time. And it was not popular. But they spoke up anyway. I think of pastors and laity that I've met throughout this area who have said, I don't care about what the zoning law says. It's 10 degrees out. And there are homeless people in our community and they need a place to be tonight. <clears throat> and they welcome them in. And then later, by the way, found out that there's a state law that requires that homeless people can be housed when the temperatures drop below freezing in any facility such as that. I look at modern day Esther's the couple of people that I knew from the Butler Church who went to the town council and said, we need to change this community because a member of our congregation had had a beer bottle thrown at him and broken on his back simply because he was like him. And children who had eggs thrown at them on the front lawn of our church because they were Latina. And by the way, the children were Puerto Rican. They were 
citizens of the United States, but that didn't matter. And they dared to speak truth to a town council at the time said, oh, we have no issues like this. And then I look around this congregation and I see that we all have the potential because this congregation, we have been doing things to speak for truth. And I say, we have modern day Esther's everywhere. Who knows, but we have been called for such a time as this to speak the truth and live the truth together and individually, whether that is you know, corporately here, whether it's in our workplaces, wherever that might be. Are we going to get it perfect? Absolutely not. Do we have safety nets? The biggest and greatest safety net we have is the power of God's Holy Spirit that lives and works in us and will be with us. And so I invite you, Let's together move to the edge of the cliff. All right? It may not, it may seem kind of scary. Let's be willing to kind of turn around and sit down into midair. And we can trust that we have the safety that God will provide. Because God is with us. God will always be with us. It's our time to move to the risky edge. Because the hand of God is there like the hand of God was with Esther. And we are never alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.